like to go ahead and call us together for morning worship. Good morning. It's good for us to be together today. It's a blessing from God to gather, to share the gifts that God has given us, and to find ways to encourage each other in an often uh, difficult world that we live in. So it's good for us to be together today. Um, and uh, welcome those of you who are joining us online. We pray that today is a blessed day for you. We're, we've been having some trouble with Facebook, and so if you, anyone ever talks to you, we're also on YouTube, so sometimes that works easier than Facebook, so, uh, but it's good for us to be together today. This is Sunday, March 3rd, 2024. I'm Pastor Phil, and uh, today is the third week in the Lenten series that we are participating in, moving towards Easter, uh, and so it'll be a couple more weeks till Easter. And uh, we are working our way through the Gospels, and we are in Jesus and the Sabbath controversies today. So when Jesus encounters the problem of uh, the people who are accusing him and the disciples of breaking the Sabbath commandments, how do, how do we work with that? So we'll, we'll take a look at that, and we'll learn something about uh, different ways to think about God and the way Jesus thought about God, and perhaps that's the way we ought to think about God as well. So it's good for us to be together today. Um, we had an interesting uh, moment this morning. We were, uh, our, our brother Frank is going to have surgery this week, and he had asked uh, our music ministry if there was a song he would like to, them to sing sometime, and he had asked Tommy a week or so ago. And, uh, and then I was at a retreat on Monday with ministers, and I heard a so this song, and I liked it, and I sent it to Joanne, to, and then Tommy talked to Joanne, and all of a sudden they both had the same song. On their, so how many songs are there in the world, you know, and that we would both pick, be picking the same song? And then they sang it for Frank this morning at the end of the first service. It's called Nothing to Fear by Audrey Assad, and it's very beautiful. It's very simple but it's very meditative and reflective. And we're going to be doing a lot more of that for the Good Friday <laughs> service this year. <coughs> we're going to have a quiet, meditative service this year. And so, uh, but it was really interesting the way God brought that from two different directions together and, and it worked out. So that's good. You know, I, as I've been reading in the, in the Gospels this these months, you know, I've mentioned to you before that I've been drawn to the Gospels, particularly Luke's Gospel this year, and I try to read it in the morning before, before I read my email or before I check the news or before I do anything else. Let, maybe let God's mind say something before everybody else says something. And um, I was reading in Luke about Herod uh, being confused and I, I was just fascinated with this word. It, he was perplexed. And I, I, I have it on my phone. I have my Bible study materials. And uh, I have it so I can touch the word. And then it will come up in the Greek language. And then it'll give me a word study of that word. So it's really handy. And I, so I was reading here. And it said Herod was puzzled about what God was doing around John the baptizer. And then it told me also that the same word is used when the disciples encounter the resurrection, that they are puzzled or baffled. You ever been baffled? You know, that's such a great word, baffled. And uh, Herod is baffled, the disciples are baffled, and even Paul is baffled. So in, in one of his letters, he says, we are afflicted, uh, afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed, but not driven to despair. So if Herod can be baffled, and the disciples can be baffled, and the Apostle Paul can be baffled, we can be baffled too, right? And uh, sometimes we just don't understand what's going on. But we don't have to be driven to despair because of that, because we trust, right? We trust that God will be with us, that God will provide for us, that maybe it'll be through the life of, the, of other believers, maybe in some way, but we believe God is with us, and so we are perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. So I hope that's true for you. Uh, the world is very confusing these days. A lot of pressures, a lot of things uh, that people are going through, uh, but uh, we trust God. 
And we try to show that. We had a report from the deacons this morning. Paul Bernhard shared a little bit about what the deacons have been doing this month. And he shared a beautiful story about a, a, a woman who was um, uh, eight months pregnant. She didn't have a place to be, a safe place to be. Uh, she was working with social services. We were able to provide a safe place for her while social services worked it out. So, uh, you know, good for you that you're supporting the deacons. You know, Paul said thank you for everybody who has been uh, giving to, to support the deacons' work especially. And, uh, you know, this is part of our ministry to show up the way Jesus showed up in the world. And so it's a very good thing. So it's good for us to be uh, together doing that. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I had shared la last week this prayer. I'll just share it again. Uh, that helps us think about the life we're called to. O oh God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So I thought that was such a, a good a good um, prayer for us. And so we welcome everybody. You know, we've said many times that um, all are welcome here. We're glad for anybody to draw near to Christ and uh, walk with us as we try ourselves to walk the path that Christ sets before us. So we're glad that you're here to join with us in worship today. And so today is a communion day. If you didn't pick up a cup, uh, everyone's welcome to communion. We practice open communion. So if you want to pick up a cup at some point during the service before we come to communion, that would be good. And so let's move into our, our worship together today. Um, you know, we use a traditional call to worship. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And it comes from the scriptures. And there's a passage in the Bible that says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And so it's the idea that at every, any given moment, maybe God is putting something on our hearts. Maybe God is, uh, you know, uh, putting an idea in that we should uh, think differently or live differently or change something. And today is the day, right? Today, this is the day God has made to respond. And so if there are things we need to let go of, we want to let go of them, bitternesses and resentments. If there are things we need to begin to do, uh, ways of... Uh, showing forgiveness or mercy, uh, today is a good day to do it. And so we're together to worship. May God grant us that grace. And so this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let me pray and then we'll sing our opening hymn. Let's pray. God, you know how easily we fall into thoughtless ruts of thoughtless religion, of habits, that we go through the motions and we follow the rules without remembering the heart. And so we pray today you would renew our faith, that you give us a sense of your love for all people, and you would reshape our practices to center on your desire that all people would thrive and be well in all of the abundance of what you have created for us. And so help us as we see you uh, defending the disciples about uh, the grain in the fields. And we would celebrate, O oh God, all of your abundance. For we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing our opening song. Our first hymn is number 624, His Eye is on the Speck. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for a heavenly home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. I know he watches me. His 
God, your heart be troubled. Listen to the words I hear. And resting on his goodness, I lose my doubt and fear. So by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. And his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches clouds arise when storms give place to sighting and the lily dies I draw the closer to him for care he sets me free his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he remain standing, let's take a moment to confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <laughs> to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end Amen Amen Part of our tradition in the second service where we keep a fuller traditional liturgy is the prayer of confession. And so it becomes a moment where we together can recognize that we have a long way to go to being all God calls us to be. We are not perfect people. We're people forgiven. And we're people being transformed by God's spirit as we walk with God, as we walk in the spirit and uh, find God at work continually transforming us. And so this is a good moment for us to be humble a little bit and to think about where we might need to think differently or act differently. Uh, we talk about prayers of omission and commission. There are things that we do we shouldn't do, and there's things we don't do that we ought to be doing. And so all of these come to mind. Prayer of Confession today um, focuses on this whole issue of 
what is the point of the commandments? And how do we think about God? Um, and we'll talk about different ways people think about God and uh, the commandments uh, that, that are given and uh, how they are meant to be a blessing and not a uh, harm to us. And so let's join in the prayer of confession. Lord, we confess that we have so often missed the point of your commandments. What you meant to guide us into blessing, we turn into a weapon of judgment and condemnation. Forgive us and help us to discern your loving purpose in all you teach us. Amen. Let's take a moment and reflect on where uh, perhaps that might uh, speak to us as we prepare to open the scripture together today. So people of Jesus Christ, here is the good news for us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we often say that God's interest is not where we've been, but where we're going, what direction we take as we receive the forgiveness and move into our futures. And so believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, our sin is forgiven. God calls us to live in peace to be, receive forgiveness and to share forgiveness with others. Jesus was asked about the commandments of God, which were the most important, and he answered that to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, these are the two greatest commandments of all. If you read that uh, passage in the Gospels, it's very interesting because immediately after that, somebody says, well, if I'm supposed to love my neighbor, who's my neighbor? And uh, Jesus then tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, which basically says whenever you encounter somebody in need and do something, you're being the neighbor to them. And so Jesus doesn't want to limit God's mercy and grace, but to expand it to be shared with all we meet. And so uh, may God give us grace to receive forgiveness and to share it with others. Amen. So I'd like to introduce a scripture for today. Um, it's uh, some stories in Luke's gospel, in Luke 6, about Jesus and the Sabbath day. So uh, in Jesus' time, uh, there were people who were the Pharisees who were very diligent about keeping the laws around the Sabbath and other laws that had developed over hundreds of years. Um, you'll find that if I, we don't have time to do all the history today, but because of the history of, of the people of Israel up to the time of Jesus, they had been in exile. They had lost their country and been in exile. And they were convinced when they came back that, uh, that God was punishing them for not keeping the Sabbath day and some other laws. And so they were convinced that we've got to keep these laws strictly or we'll lose our nation. And that's the way they were thinking. And uh, Jesus has a whole different way of thinking about things. And so we encounter that uh, today. But as we work our way through the Gospel of Luke, we're traveling with Jesus from uh, Ash Wednesday, the temptation in the wilderness, and then the rejection at Nazareth, the call uh, of the first disciples, and now the, the Sabbath controversies where Jesus' view of God and their view of God come into conflict with each other. So uh, the Pharisees, of course, are very religious people. They're not professional religious people. They're not the priests, but they are uh, very religious lay people. Uh, and so they are determined to keep all of the hundreds of rules that have developed over the years uh, where the commands of God have been expanded into hundreds of smaller rules. And so Jesus, will find, is less focused on their rules and on bringing the blessing of God to hungry and hurting people. And so let's take a look at that in uh, Luke. So we read this. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. 
So we know from the Old Testament, <coughs> there's a passage in Deuteronomy <coughs> that says this is okay. If you're walking through somebody's grain fields and you're hungry or you want to pick some grain, and as long as you just use your hands, you cannot harvest it with any tools. That was the rule in Deuteronomy, which, which is, you know, back in the original books, the first five books of the Bible. So they're doing that. They're walking through the grain fields and they're picking some heads of grain and they're rubbing them and eating the kernels. And so they're grateful. They see the abundance of God's uh, blessing in the grain and they're thankful to God for the kernels they eat. But it's on the Sabbath day. And if you remember the Sabbath, of course, is the seventh day of creation and you, you're not supposed to work. Uh, it's supposed to be a day holy to the Lord. You, you set it apart in a special way. And so uh, they had developed rules that, well, on that day you can't work. And so you're, they said to the disciples, you're doing work, so you're breaking the command of God. So, uh, so some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? <coughs> and Jesus answered them. So, so it's, it's like they are the accusers, right? The, uh, the disciples are doing something. Jesus is with them. They get accused by the Pharisees, and then Jesus defends them. Kind of sounds like a courtroom, right? The prosecutors and the defense attorney. And so they're being, Jesus is defending them. And he says, Jesus answered them, have you never read what David did? So this is the Old Testament. All the people in Jesus' time in the synagogue knew the stories of David, the Old Testament, King David. And have you never read about David? what he did when he and his companions were hungry. So David, there's a thing in the Old Testament where David is fleeing a, a revolt against him. He's hungry. He goes into the temple, the tabernacle, and he takes the loaves of bread that are for the priests. Only the priests were supposed to eat these loaves of bread. But David goes in and he takes the loaves and he shares them with his friends who are there. And, and uh, the, uh, his companion. So he said, Have you, don't you remember that? Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He broke the law. He entered the house of God and he ate the consecrated bread. He ate what is lawful only the priests to eat and he gave some to his companions. And this was okay. So maybe your carefulness and your accusing is not right. Maybe the point is if hungry people are fed, that's a good thing. And so he said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So Jesus has a different view of God than they do. And then immediately Luke gives us another story. He says, while we're talking about this, let me tell you another one. And on another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching. So it's a Sabbath day again. And a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. And I was reflecting um, this morning that uh, when I grew up clam digging on the Great South Bay, we had, there was a guy who worked the bay who had a shriveled hand. And I don't know, you know, this was 1970s, so I guess he never got the right care. He was probably 60 years old at that point. But his hand was all like this. Like a, and he, and uh, he, um, so he worked the tongs like this, he kind of, and pulled him up with one hand. So I, I've, I kind of always picture him when I read this story that his hand was sh shriveled up. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So Jesus is teaching and they could care less about whatever Jesus is teaching. Isn't that amazing, right? Wouldn't you love to have Jesus teach? I'd rather have Jesus teach than me teach, right? I'd love to have Jesus teaching. And they don't care. They're just watching for something to pick on, right? The, so Jesus is teaching, and the Pharisees and the teachers of law are looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So what can we catch him in today? How can we, you know, find something that we don't agree with here? Uh, looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watch him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what, <laughs> what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up 
and stand here in front of everybody. We're going to have a showdown on this thing. Stand here in front of everybody. So he got up and stood there. And Jesus said to them, everybody there, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And nobody answers, of course. And uh, so he looked around at them all. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. And all the people realized that Jesus was the best thing in the world, and they agreed to follow his way of viewing God. Wasn't that great? <laughs> but that's not what happened, was it? You know, you would think, right? Great. Hey, this is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. But we read this. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss one another what they might do to Jesus. How do you get in a mindset where you cannot be happy for something good happening? And instead, all you're doing is look to pick on it. How, how do you get in that mindset? Especially as a religious person. Or maybe it's because of being a religious person here that they get in that picky, we're going to catch you and condemn you thing. So anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that in our message today. So I did the children's message today, and I, I w I've been talking to them about all the things that are uh, showing up around Easter. And so I was talking to them about aisle six in the supermarket is where Easter is this year, and all the things I find there. So last week I had found the chocolate rabbits, and we talked about multiplying things and the way Jesus multiplied disciples, and that was a good thing. So today I found peeps. So I brought peeps for them. And the peeps are the marshmallow things, right? <laughs> marshmallow things. They're supposed to be chickens, right? They're supposed to be little baby chicks because baby chicks peep. But I found bunny peeps. Oh, so I was like, what happened here? The bunnies don't peep, do they? But these are bunny peeps. And so I had the bunny peeps with the kids. And I said... I was talking to them about that. And I said, these are not real bunnies, are they? And they're like, no, they're made of sugar, you know, and they're made of uh, thing. And I said, these are fake bunnies. And they're, yeah, they're fake bunnies. And I said, uh, do you have real bunnies that run around at the house? And they said, yes. And I said, it's interesting, Jesus, as he's talking to the people here, he sees that they have a fake God. They have a God that they made up on their own. And this God is just watching to catch you on something and condemn you and tell you that you were wrong and make you feel bad. And that's the God that these Pharisees are, are created. It's a fake God. And Jesus wants the people to know the true God who delights in healing people and feeding people and bringing blessing and abundance to the world. And so, uh, so I said to them, don't have a fake God like they did, have the real one. And then there was only one family of kids today, so they got all the three packages of peeps uh, to take home. So they were happy about that. So that was good. So let's sing our middle hymn, and then we'll continue. Our middle hymn is number 463, I Will Remember Thee.
be seated. So in thinking about this, as I uh, was preparing for this, I happened to read an article this past week about the post-scarcity economy. Now, that was a phrase that caught my attention because I'm like, scarcity, yeah, I know about that. We're trying to do food ministry. We're trying to do housing ministry. There's a lot of scarcity going on. What is a post-scarcity economy about? And so I read the article through. It's a long article. I gave it to you in my notes for you to look at. It was really interesting to uh, look at the fact that uh, from some perspective, uh, economists back about 50 years ago began to operate economic policies on the basis of scarcity. I didn't know that. You know, I didn't even know there was another option. Uh, but they decided that we're going to operate the economy on scarcity. And the article goes on to say, half a century later, forecasts of an abundant future with economic security for all are once again breaking through the politics of scarcity. And I, this was totally unintelligible to me. I'm like, what are you talking about? And so it's very interesting. They were talking about that uh, the way we talk about things structures the way we do things and has, has real effects on the world. So if you think about things from a scarcity perspective and you, you live as if everything was scarcity, it shapes a lot of how you relate to people and what happens in the world and in the economic world. But if you, on the other hand, have an abundant uh, mindset that, you know, through fusion energy, there's going to be energy for cheap for all and uh, food, we're learning to create new kinds of food that will not, uh, disease won't get it and there'd be food for all and there could be an abundance. And we could actually begin to think this way and lead into creating a world that would be more like that. But that was very interesting. You know, it's an odd idea when we think about what's going on right now because it doesn't look like there could be an abundance for everybody. But the art article argues that it is possible if we have a change of mindset and a change of economic policy the way we do things. Um, the idea that there's enough for all and that the world is something other people have talked about. So I've mentioned this uh, through the years when I've been involved with Church World Service. We've been involved with Church World Service that was founded in after World War II when there were so many refugees in Europe and the, all the churches in the United States, 50 churches got together, 50 denominations got together and founded Church World Service to deal with the Europe post-World War II refugee situation. And, re and help many people to find homes and safety and food. And their, one of their mottos is enough for all, that there is enough for all. And so they believe <laughs> that, <laughs> that it's part of our responsibility to show the abundance of God's world to people so that they live in a world where God has provided for them. So Church World Service has always been about that. So it's interesting to ask the question about Jesus. Does Jesus have a scarcity mindset or does he have an abundance mindset? Does he think there's enough? Does he think that we have God's provision? And immediately you begin to think about Matthew's gospel where Jesus is talking about worry, about food and clothes. And this is in, um, so we sang his eyes on the sparrow today which really kind of comes from this passage where Jesus talks about the birds and the flowers. Let me just read this for us to, to say that Jesus seems to have an abundance mindset. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. So he's saying the birds, God takes care of them, and are you not much more valuable than they? So for Jesus, he sees a world where God is caring for everything, and you're the, one of the most valuable things. Will he not 
much more care for you, uh, right? Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And, of course, the answer is no, but we can shorten our life by worrying and getting us all, uh, having all kinds of reactions in our body of anxiety and worry. And then Jesus goes on, why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? And I can't help but think about the fact, and some of you know this, that uh, in the deserts of South America, uh, there are piles of clothes that are being uh, trucked there and shipped there to keep the cost of clothes high because there's too much supply and there's not enough. So we're going to have to reduce the supply. And so there are piles of clothes. This is a, a whole issue that you can read about. Uh, so there's more clothes than enough for the whole world, but we're not, uh, we're not, it's, it's not God's problem, it's our problem. So uh, that's the fast fashion, that's an interesting conversation. So, um, so he says, God clothes the flowers, uh, the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into fire. Will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Right? So if we were doing things God's way, we wouldn't have piles of clothes in the South American deserts, uh, rotting in the sunlight, and, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So it seems fairly clear that Jesus has an abundance mindset about the world. Jesus sees God as generous, and Jesus sees God as good. Jesus sees God's world as filled with blessings for all. And Jesus sees God as caring for us, and Jesus seeks the good of all that he meets. Um, and so Jesus, when the grain field sees the grain as a gift of God, he says, look at all the abundance of what God has provided. What a gift and a blessing this is. Jesus had a mindset of seeing the world in gratitude and thankfulness and God's abundant provision. And so that's a way to, to think about God. Jesus seemed to think about God that way. And, you know, it's been said that we become like the God that we worship. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. But if you have a God who is full of uh, watching you all the time, like the Pharisees in, in the synagogue, just watching you to mess up, doesn't really care about if anything good is going on, but I'm just watching to see if you mess up. Aha, I got you. Right? Some people have a God like that, and that's the way they view God, just waiting to catch us. And they become like that then. They say, this is what God's like, this is what I'm going to be like. I'm going to go around and watch and catch people uh, missing up and, and doing things that I think are a violation of God's law. If your God we worship is full of wrath and judgment, then we become people full of wrath and judgment as well. But if we worship a God who is kind and compassionate to all that God has created, who feeds the birds, who feeds, clothes the flowers, who cares for us, who Jesus says you can trust God to provide for you, then we become people who say, well, we can trust God to provide and we're going to share with you and we celebrate the abundance that God has. It all kind of goes back to the kind of God that you have in your mind, whether you have a, a peep bunny fake God or whether you have the true God. And the Pharisees had their God that they had created. Uh, we would call that an idol. They had created an idol, and they did not see God the way Jesus saw God. So when Jesus sees a grain field full of wheat, he sees a sign of a loving God providing abundantly for people loved by God. 
and the disciples rub some of the hands of wheat, uh, the heads of wheat between their hands, and they eat, and Jesus says, it's a good and blessed thing. God's people are being cared for by the gifts of God, the gifts of God for the people of God. And Jesus is happy, and they're happy, until the Pharisees come along. And then the Pharisees come along and say, well, not so fast. Not everybody sees it that way. And so the Pharisees are judgment-focused followers who see an opportunity to judge Jesus and condemn him. And so this is the same thing that happens in the synagogue. Jesus is teaching. What a wonderful thing for Jesus to be teaching. There's a man with a shriveled hand, and Jesus, uh, might, the power of God might be present to heal him. What a wonderful thing. But no, not if you're focused on something else. And so they're just watching for an opportunity to accuse him. And so that's their uh, way. The judgment-focused followers don't see an opportunity to thank God for abundance. They see an opportunity to judge and condemn Jesus because it's the Sabbath day. And their view of Sabbath day is about a God who limits and restricts them, who would be happier if you were hungry all day, then that you should harvest some wheat grains and eat them. That's their God. And, you know, I, I kind of grew up with that God in, in my Dutch community. Um, you know, when, when I grew up, we would go visit my grandma on Sundays after church, which is not the real Sabbath day, but it's the day we talk about the Sabbath sometimes. And they had a rule in the Dutch community that you couldn't cook on Sunday. And so they would cook on Saturday and then eat cold on Sunday. Now, there's nothing wrong with that if that's the way you feel like you want to honor God. What's wrong with it is when that becomes an opportunity for you to judge and condemn others who don't do the same thing. And Paul will say this in Romans 14. He says, if you want to keep a holy day and and not eat meat or whatever, good for you. Do it unto the Lord. But you can't then condemn somebody who doesn't do it because the, God created all food to be enjoyed and to be received with gratitude. And so, um, you know, their view of the Sabbath day is about a God who limits and restricts them. One of the other fun stories that come from my community where I grew up uh, is the elders there's part of the elders' minutes of that church where I grew up. It, the elders called in a man to talk to the elders. They wanted to talk to him about, you know, his life because they had seen him ride a bicycle on Sunday. And so this is in the minutes of the consistory, you know, that so-and-so was seen riding a bicycle. We, the elders called him in. We had to talk with him. And, you know, and so what kind of a God image do you get from that? And I know, you know, a number of us grew up with this. You know, we grew up with this. But I think the passages like this challenge us to say, is that really the God we want to represent? Is that the God Jesus is representing in the world? Or is Jesus just happy that, that his disciples have some of God's abundant food for them to eat? And what could be better on the Sabbath day than that they should be receiving the gifts of God with thankfulness? So a whole different way of looking at things. So um, it's really difficult to show the great gap between these two approaches to God, right? One is about a good and a generous God who rejoices in seeing people fed and thriving and well, uh, and that's what the focus is on. And the other group is about a mean and condemning God who looks for opportunities to catch people breaking a rule and say, aha, gotcha, I'm going to condemn you for that. Uh, you know, we are headed for Good Friday when we will talk about the cross. We'll talk about Jesus bearing away our sin, taking judgment on himself so that people then can then live a life of freedom, can live a new life of freedom from judgment and condemnation. The Apostle Paul will say in Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so we are, we are free from the judgment of God. We're free to celebrate and to live in the freedom that the cross has won for us. And Jesus intercedes for us. Just like the disciples here, you've got the disciples doing the eating the grain, and then you've got the accusers over here 
and Jesus is defending them, like the defense attorney. And Hebrews chapter 7 tells us this. You know, in Hebrews chapter 7, it says uh, Jesus has become a guarantor of a better covenant. Not the old covenant, but the new covenant. He's become a guarantee of a better covenant. He says, in the old covenant, there were many priests because they died and you had to have a new one since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So do you, uh, do you ever think about this? You know, when something you feel condemned, you feel accused, Jesus is interceding for you in the throne room of God that you are free of condemnation. And the Spirit will continue to work in your life, but we are freed from condemnation. And so it says, such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. And so we live as people in a new covenant. We're going to share communion today, and he'll talk about this is my blood of the new covenant, which is for you. We're accepted by God through Christ. And so God created an abundant world to be received with gratitude and genero shared with generosity. And uh, there's a hymn that says this. Um, we sometimes sing this at Thanksgiving. Uh, it's a great hymn about the abundance of God. It says, um, we plow the fields and scatter the good seed on the land but it is fed and watered by God's almighty hand. He sends the snow in winter, the warmth to swell the grain, the breezes and the sunshine, and soft refreshing rain. All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. And thank the Lord, thank the Lord for all his love. He only is the maker of all things near and far. He paints the wayside flower, he lights the evening star, the wind and waves obey him. By him the birds are fed. Much more to us, his children, he gives our daily bread. All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. Then thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for all his love. We thank you then, O Father, for all things bright and good, the seed time and the harvest, our life, our health, our food. Accept the gifts we offer for all your love imparts. And that which you most welcome our humble, thankful hearts. All good gifts around us, sent from heaven above, then thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for all his love. And so the disciples uh, are taught by Jesus to think that way, that they, they can celebrate the gifts of God and not worry about uh, condemn, being condemned or being accused, but to live with gratitude and thankfulness, trusting in God, rejoicing, and allowing God to work through them to bring good news to others. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for uh, all that you show us about God. We confess that we often create our own fake gods. We make idols, and, um, and they don't quite fit with the way you do things or the way you think about things. And so we pray that you would give us the ability to forsake our idols and to worship the true living God who cares for the birds, who cares for the flowers, who values us greatly, who provides for us and calls us to receive grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, give us grateful, thankful hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we come to celebrate communion. I'm going to uh, skip ahead here to the communion liturgy that we will use. In our second service, we use the full traditional liturgy, and so I'll be reading it and then inviting you to respond um, to that. And so if you have a cup or if you need a cup, now's a good time to get it. So let me lead us into this. 
Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper, which we are about to celebrate, is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We come in remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent of the Father into the world to assume our flesh and blood and to fulfill for us all obedience to the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful death of the cross. By his death, resurrection, and ascension, he established a new and eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation that we might be accepted of God and never be forsaken by him. We come to have communion with the same Christ who has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the world. In the breaking of the bread, he makes himself known to us as a true heavenly bread that strengthens us unto life eternal. In the cup of blessing, he comes to us as the vine in whom we must abide if we are to bear fruit. We come in hope, believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and foretaste of the feast of love of which we shall partake when his kingdom has fully come, when with unveiled face we shall behold him made like unto him in his glory. Since by his death, resurrection, and ascension, Christ has obtained for us the life-giving spirit who unites us all in one body, so are we to receive this supper in true love, mindful of the communion of saints. And so responsively, the Lord be with you and also with lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy and right it is, and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places, O Lord, our Creator, almighty and everlasting God. You created heaven with all its hosts, the earth with all its plenty, and you have given us life and being and preserve us by your providence. But you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal Word, made flesh for us and for our salvation. For the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you, we praise and bless you, O God. With your whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. Saying together, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Most righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ, and grant that being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And so uh, we practice open communion. We invite all those who have faith in Christ to share with us and uh, draw near to Christ in the supper. We come not because we're strong, but because we're weak. We come because we love the Lord a bit and want to learn to love him more. We come not because we've been good enough to deserve to come to this table, but we come in all of our brokenness and need because Christ invites us. He says, come to me and live. And so we come uh, to receive God's grace and blessing and to thank God for all of his goodness to us. And so as we um, hold the cup off for the bread, the Lord Jesus, the same night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so the bread which we break is our communion, our fellowship, our sharing in the body of Christ, 
given for us. The same way, also after they had eaten, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so the cup of blessing for which we give thanks is our fellowship, our communion, our sharing in the blood of Christ shed for us. So we are the blessed people of God. Uh, Christ has given himself for us that we might stand in the presence of God without judgment and without condemnation. He is borne it away on the cross. He stands and intercedes for us in any moment when we are accused. Uh, we are the beloved children of God. Nothing can separate us from his love. This is a gift of God for the people of God. Amen. So as we come to our, our closing, uh, let's join in prayer. Uh, again, Frank is going for surgery on Tuesday, uh, and uh, uh, he's confident, but, you know, let's pray for Frank as he goes for that surgery. Uh, we continue to pray for Vashti, who is at home uh, with the, the tumor on her spine, and that's a problem, so let's pray uh, for that. Um, uh, uh, Marilyn is home, so let's give thanks to God that Marilyn is home and uh, pray for God's healing in her life. Um, other, uh, Sylvia is still home with her knee. Other requests that we need to remember today? Daughter-in-law, Patty. Okay, a friend with cancer. Prayers. Sometimes we are baffled and perplexed. Right? Indeed. Let's pray together. Lord, we give thanks to you for all of your goodness to us. That when we are in the midst of people who accuse us and find fault with us, we recognize that you stand on our side with us. What a gift. Lord, and you speak in our favor. And you invite us to receive and live in the love and mercy of God uh, to receive your spirit and to live lives worthy of the calling that we've received. And so thank you for your love for us. Lord, we uh, think of the world around us, a world that is torn by so much that uh, needs to experience your grace and mercy. People live in hatred and violence, uh, harboring resentments and uh, striking out and harming others, accusing rather than defending. And so, Lord, we pray for our world. We think of all places of uh, uh, war and, and violence. We pray for peace to reign. We think of all places of suffering, uh, refugees, those with illnesses, those in poverty. Um, Lord, we ask your grace there that they might experience somehow the abundance of a good God. Lord, we pray for those who are ill, those who are grieving, grant healing mercy in their lives. Lord, for our nation, that we pray for all of our leaders at whatever level they are, that we might live in uh, freedom and justice. We might find ways to work together for the good of all. Lord, we pray <laughs> together for our community and we thank you for our community and the blessings that it brings to us we thank you for all who dedicate themselves to the well-being of community for doctors and nurses for police and firefighters for teachers and counselors and uh, social workers and uh, emergency personnel and many others Lord people who uh, are not thinking first of themselves but are thinking of ways to devote themselves to the good of others and perhaps to be a channel of your goodness. For Lord, you have called us to be royal priests and stewards in this world of your goodness. And so we seek to be disciples. And we pray together the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll sing our last hymn. The last hymn is number 492 at Calvary. this benediction as we leave people of Jesus Christ forgiven defended by Christ at peace with God living in the abundance of God to share with others as you go may the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine on you be gracious to you the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give to you peace amen parting song, a traditional sing. Some people like to gather in the middle, join hands. Others prefer to stay where they are. Let's sing our closing song. Mm -hmm.